Thank you. And Helga, I will hand it to you. Thank you so much, Judith. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be asked here to this afternoon in the confines of the AMC uh, conference to moderate a panel of fantastic experts who will discuss a little bit about the vetting process at TEFAF. Um, you have their CVs in front of you, so if I will just maybe call their names so they can uh, acknowledge who they are. We have Andrea Achi. And we have Carol Iliel. I'm going um, alphabetically. We have Wim Pibes and uh, Arthur Wheelock. Um, and between them, they have decades of experience as curators of major muse museums in fields ranging from Byzantine art to modern and contemporary, as vet and as vetters for TEFAS. I think we agree that there are three very important elements in the vetting process the questions of authenticity of condition and documentation. And last not, but not least, the question of assembling a vetting committee will be discussed. The conversation is meant to pull back the curtain on this vetting process and to openly discuss the issues and difficulties as curators and scholars, those of us who are participating in this vetting process, as well as perhaps the need for change in the process. So with that, I would like to give the word to Arthur Wheelock, who will speak a bit about where we are today and the question and problems of establishing authenticity. Arthur. Thank you, Alka. Thank you all for being here and looking forward to our discussion this afternoon. Um, I am, a, as all we all are, I've uh, vetted for a lot of years at Maastricht, and just to give you a framework for the vetting process there, um, there are over 30 vetting committees, all in different fields, and um, about 200 vetting members, uh, if I'm correct, Vim can correct me on all that, from over 100 institutions around the world. I am on the committee that deals with the Northern Baroque paintings, Dutch, Flemish, and German, um, paintings that are in the fair that traditionally has been a, a, the bulk of the paintings, but that's becoming less so these days, but there's still quite a few. Um, and the committee I am on has 16 members. And in that committee, there are Dutch, Flemish, English, Scottish, German members. Um, they're from museums, they're curators, they're um, professors. Um, there are two conservators that are with our group that go around with us. Um, and so that is the, the makeup of that particular committee. The, the committees are different in size. So the, the Dutch one is pretty large compared to other committees, but it's a, it is a, that mix is pretty consistent, I think, throughout the, the whole TAFOF experience. So before we begin vetting, we all gather together and Vim or someone who is head of the organization will give us the, the um, guidelines about how we are approached as sort of ethical guidelines, the standards of, of, of the fair and what we are expected to do. Um, they, we're introduced to the scientific committee because there's a whole re scientific research component that is there for, we have issues that we cannot resolve in looking at the works in the artist's um, stands. Then we can take a work to one of these uh, areas where you can have extra uh, technical examinations done on works that, that are relevant to the questions we have. Um, the, uh, the one mes major uh, message we always get is that we are there to protect the buyer. We're not there to, to protect the dealer. We are there to sort of the best interest of the interest of the fair is to be able to sh be the, the people who come to the fair can feel that they are what they're Thinking of acquiring is reliable, been reliably vetted by people who know the field, who have thought about it, who have had careful discussions about it, and that they've given them premature on that, all those elements to the extent that they can. So with all that background, then we head off to our, our various areas where we go from, from gallery uh, dealer to dealer stand. Um, and pretty much uh, all of us have a, a chairman of our department, of our, of our vetting committee. So our, my, the chairman of the old master of paintings at this point is Christopher Brown, who was former curator of Dutch painting at the National Gallery in London and uh, director of the Ashmolean. And, um, the, um, <clears throat> and then basically we, we go in um, the stands and we wander around, um, all of us independently or maybe you know, talking with somebody, if we find an issue, 
um, that we would like to discuss, then we come together um, as a group and, and have that discussion. And sometimes the issues are, um, in terms of authenticity, is what you want to focus on is, you know, about style and, and, and how characteristic is of this artist or not characteristic. And does that attribution make sense? But we also talk about conservation and documentation. And if we have questions, all that documentation and the labeling has to be there so that we can double check what we think with what the dealer provides. Um, so some of these discussions are pretty quick and uh, I think they uh, are easy for most people to um, come to terms with, but sometimes these discussions go on for some length of time, half an hour or so, we will go back and forth and back and forth and, and thinking about what it is that, what are the issues? And, and all of us have certain expertises in that group. It's a very carefully constructed group with, with some who are, have German expertise or Flemish or, or Dutch, or we have uh, experiences from the museums that we've been involved with. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, knowledge base that is very impressive group of people, I've got to say. I've always admired the people that I'm with and the discussions I find are incredibly interesting. So in the end, we'll make an assessment of what we think. And there are various things that we can do. We can say, well, that painting is not in the interest of the fair. We need, that dealer needs to take it off. Or it is, um, needs to change the label. Or he um, has to have more documentation. Or there has to, there are different things that um, are listed about various works in that particular stand. And then that information on that particular, uh, each that goes through each of the stands. And then that information is sent to the dealer in question, that dealer will then receive this and he, that the dealer, and the, by, I should say the dealers are not present during this discussion. This is just the vetting committee. The no, no dealers are in the, the stands when that process is going on. So they get a list from the vetting committee that, that this and that recommendation. Um, and the, de the dealer then has an opportunity to come back at, at another time to meet with a vetting committee. And they can have, have done a couple of things. They can either say, we accept your decision to, to take it off the stand. We ex accept your, uh, your conditions that to change the labeling and we will provide more documentation. Um, they also can, can argue their case. They can say why they think that the, the labeling and the attribution and um, everything is, is what it should be. And then we will have a discussion with the dealer at that point, and that discussion will go on for an amount of time it needs. And then the dealer leaves that discussion, goes off someplace else, and we reassess the uh, our decision on the basis of that discussion and that information that the dealers provided. And that information then is provided to the dealer and the dealer has to abide by that decision in the end. That is the, the, um, the end of that process. Yeah, thank you so much. So essentially it comes down to three choices in question of authenticity. We accept that the painting or the work of art is by the artist or whoever is designated in, on the, in the labeling. So it is Leonardo. And if we do not agree, uh, or, then it has to be taken down a notch. And we could agree to say it is perhaps attributed to Leonardo or perhaps the school of or the circle of. So you have to really uh, be very careful about what it is you're trying to convey to the buyer how highly valued this work is within the uh, uh, oeuvre of a particular artist. And then there is only, there are really only two choices for the dealer is to either remove it because he doesn't want to sell it as an attributed to uh, and or label it down to attributed to or school of or just to, to remove it. And generally it, when the committee says no, it's no. Um, there's really no, there's really no combat come back at the end for, for the dealer. So the other really important question, I think one of the great considerations is the one that Carol is going to address is the question of condition. Um, Carol? Sure, so the short of it is, um, if it looks too good to be true, it probably isn't true. And if it looks too bad to be true, it probably isn't true. But there's, <laughs> there's a lot of thought that goes into um, coming to those decisions. So I would say, I mean, all of these dealers, um, produce a lot of documentation 
um, provenance information, bibliographic history on works. But at the end of the day, um, as we all know as curators, what we're doing is looking at works of art and um, really assessing what it is that we're seeing. So um, in this context, uh, just you know, having seen lots of other works of art is really helpful. And um, I will also say that the scientific committee is also extremely helpful in the context of condition. Uh, the, the, uh, there are two different scientific committees for the TAFOF in New York and the one in Maastricht, um, but they're both very professional museum conservators or former museum conservators. They come with extremely um, sophisticated equipment. So there's like a whole little portable lab that gets set up at the fair and works can be taken to this portable lab. And we um, really depend um, very heavily on their expertise because sometimes at the end of the day, you can't know what you're looking at unless you have those extra um, scientific eyes. So, and of course there are very different kinds of issues that come up for very different kinds of art. So I'm vetting modern and contemporary art and we've had issues of um, a Moreau painting from the twenties that um, was so heavily overpainted that it essentially was no longer a Miro. But the only way we really could know that was to have the scientific committee look at that painting. Uh, I know that the antiquities committee has had issues where something looks beautiful, an object looks beautiful and coherent, but when it's imaged using X radiography or other kinds of imaging, it turns out that it's pieced together from multiple fragments from different sources. So in fact, it has nothing to do with what it purports to be. So those are the kinds of things that you actually can't necessarily see with the naked eye. Um, there also was a period of time where dealers, some deal, a few dealers were using um, varnishes that were blocking varnishes that uh, meant that black light wouldn't show anything because the varnish blocked that kind of refraction and reflection. Um, that has since been banned from TAFOF. Um, so, but it sometimes takes the scientific committee to confirm that what we think we're seeing is in fact what we're seeing and that that is a blocked varnish you know a, a disallowed varnish and then those works have to go so it's it's um it's a combination of uh you know book expertise experience knowledge looking and then scientific expertise um my i can't speak for all the vetting committees but i know my vetting committee always has a conservator attached to it not as a part of the scientific committee but who literally walks around the fair with us um, so we have sort of immediate scientific expertise, and then she can work with the scientific committee if we have to ask for work to be taken to their portable lab. So it's um, quite a process, and I will say I have learned a lot from the process. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes we have unhappy dealers in our wake, and that's part of the deal. Sometimes we have unhappy fair people in our wake, and that's part of the deal too. So uh, yeah, but I have butted heads. <laughs> so um, anyway. That's uh, what I can say about condition. That's that's so interesting, and I think we've all we've all had problems where we said, well, you know, it looks awfully good. And I remember walking in once, uh, perchance, into the discussion after the fair that the antiquities committee was having about a very large vase, and in the end, the only thing they could agree on that it was a vase. They couldn't tell from what era, from what place, or from when. Or, uh, and so it was, it was really a revelation because once you start looking with all these technical um, uh, possibilities, but also with just years and years and decades of experience, saying, no, the Greeks didn't do that. But then again, this kind of stone is only found there. But could it have been uh, Egyptian? It really becomes a very, very sophisticated discussion. In my world with this 19th century painting, we don't have that kind of a, a terrible problem. Uh, but there are uh, paintings that are terribly abraded. And um, you do want to make clear to the buyer that this is something that is not in first quality if this is what they're uh, intending to buy as a van gogh for instance or that something as carol has said has been terribly overpainted or repaired or cut down these are things that the buyers should know and something that the um 
um, dealers really should reveal in their documentation. And the documentation is something that we, especially in the 19th century committee, look at very, very carefully, because unlike the uh, antiquities uh, people, we almost have too much information. We know when everybody, you know, turned around in bed, there are so many, there are so many documents. And, uh, but we do look at them very closely to make sure that we've really covered uh, the points. And I must say over the last few years, TEFA has gotten incredibly much more sophisticated in having all this material available for us at the stands. And with that, I'd like to give it to Andrea, who's going to talk about the problem of documentation. Yeah, so thank you very much. And so I have to say that I'm not on the vetting committee, but as a curator uh, who goes to art fairs, I think about documentation um, and what's enough documentation. I was trained as an archaeologist, and archaeology is about documentation. And so when we're out in the field, with every little piece, we know exactly um, where it is um, in a room, and uh, we know what was also around it. And then when it comes out, we know who's touched it, and then what store room it goes into, and then what museum it goes into. And so, and I actually use that approach to my curatorial practice. I, I think a lot about the type of antiquities that are, are under my curatorial purview. And so when I, I look at the documentations um, at art fairs, and you know, sometimes it's just a provenance um, that uh, it's um, from 1970s, which is, um, that's, that's a part of the law and that's appropriate, but to what extent do, are we also looking back um, for a more precise documentation and uh, whose role is to provide that? You know, um, dealers, they have, um, especially the ancient um, antiquities dealers, they have a, a lot of documentation to have people working on these types of issues, but they only um, sometimes give just enough um, for the betting committee to approve it to be on the floor. Whereas if um, a, a museum decides to um, potentially acquire it, there all that documentation goes to the curatorial department and then we have prominence researchers also uh, looking through that documentation. But if a private collector looks at it, sometimes they don't have um, those resources to um, really verify um, that type of documentation. But then Sometimes there's objects that have a lot of documentation, like West African bronzes, for example. And we know that the condition is good. We know that where it comes from. Um, but then is that enough for it to also be on the floor? And so there's also these ethical issues as well. Like we have all this documentation, but still should it be on the floor? And then, you know, it's also interesting that um, different terms or, and definitions of disciplines are, are changing. And so for the um, sections in the betting committees, you have ancient art and then um, Chinese art or um, ethnic art. Um, but for my field, Byzantine art and medieval art, the, um, the definitions are being expansive. So now medieval Ethiopian art, uh, Ethiopian art is now medieval art, or um, Egyptian art from the ninth century is now um, medieval art or uh, Byzantine art. Um, Nubian bronzes from the seventh century that might be um, antiquities or um, Byzantine art. And so what type of documentation do we need for those to be um, on, uh, on the floor of, um, of these art fairs? Because they kind of fall into these cracks that aren't necessarily in the guidelines of the betting committee. Yeah, it's it's really is very difficult, and I think uh, the documentation is a wonderful sort of first step to clear from an ethical point of view whether this object should be traded at, at all, and uh, it, it becomes part of its its history and its package uh, as it as it moves on through the fairs to private collectors to museums back and forth. And of course, you've all been following the you know the the, the histories right now of things being deaccessioned and returned to the countries of origins for various reasons. I, in the 19th century, we've had, of course, a lot of problems with art that was seized by the Nazis. So for years now, the uh, TAFOF has been very, very diligent about having everything go through art loss register, because at least that's a first step to make sure that nobody's actually, uh, this is on nobody's list that it's actually being, being sought. So just to uh, give us the ideal situation of what a vetter does does and how to put a, together a the ideal vetting uh, committee. We'll leave it, I think, to, to Wim Pipes. Uh, and then we will be able to uh, take questions from the floor and also virtual questions. So Wim, the perfect vetter and the ideal vetting committee. Uh, thank you, that's, uh, that's two questions. Well, many things already have been said, but who of you in the audience have been to TAFAF? 
Oh, that's quite a few. That's good. That's good. So yeah, well, most of you know then that that it's it's a large fair, and there are many art fairs in the world, indeed. However, there's only one with a very strict and and large number of vetting uh, members, uh, as Arthur said in Maastricht, uh, over 200 uh, specialists from all over the world coming together for a few days to to check all the all the objects. And not only that, um, in advance already, uh, the dealers have to make sure that all the objects that are on the fair are um, have a clear and clean provenance, uh, meaning um, uh, World War II, no problems. Uh, it should be uh, CITES, or CITES, you, you, you mentioned it in, in, in English. So ivory and, and other kind of, of, of uh, materials from, from animals that should not be uh, should be before a certain date otherwise it's not allowed to uh, to be on the show um and of course there's the art loss register has not been mentioned yet but uh, so no stolen goods are uh, are allowed of course on the fair so and everything is uh, in the in the interest of uh, of the buyer and in the interest of the fair so what is the ideal vetter um he or she should be um, leading in his field or her field of, of expertise. Uh, so it could be academics or curators or conservators. Um, and more and more, we see an, an, a growing role for, uh, as Carol already mentioned, uh, for the scientific research um, uh, people who can see and investigate and find more than, than there is just that meets the eye. I mean, uh, looking looking really in inside a vase or an inside a bronze sculpture, or inside uh, inside any any object behind the the, the varnish uh, of a painting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, of course, there's the expertise, the 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 the, the very. I'm an art historian, I would say the old fashioned way of, of looking at a painting and, and making, making an, your opinion about attribution and authenticity, of course, that's, that's still the nucleus and the most important. Uh, but still, there is, there is a growing role for the scientific uh, committee to, to, to check and to double check if, uh, if what, what meets the eye, if that is really what we see. Um, so the ideal committee is is a committee that uh, in 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 all the different fields is a combination of of people uh, diverse from several angles um, who meet at the end and have a common opinion about if an object yes or no is allowed to be on on sale on the fair. So. Uh, Thank that, you. That covers it all, I think. Yes, yeah. and I would just add that you have to be really good afoot because Tefaf, in, especially in Maastricht, is huge. And you will spend days just walking from, from one stand to the other. So it's an exhausting process. But we do try to be exhaustive as well. And I think um, yeah, it's a challenge to, to the committees. It's sometimes hard for the committees to agree on something because there sometimes are fine points. And as Arthur was saying, do you want to address that some more just the, the the idea of saying it is authentic or not is that sort of a gut reaction or uh something very experienced only well i, I don't think you can separate them entirely um but uh, for sure there's a gut reaction to, to art i mean you got to respond to art but you're in there as a certain function process um so with that gut reaction, you draw on your experience to say, okay, well, this is a very similar to a work that I curated um, for many years, and I can see similarities, but on the other hand, I see a lot of differences, and then I can articulate those discussions, but then there'll be others in that group who have had similar experience. So I think it's a, it, I find it, as I, I think I mentioned to you, the, the group dynamics of the vetting is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Watch how the discussion unfolds and wh where the arguments end up going. And they, they really do evolve. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's, it is, a, and it is a, it's a, as you say, it's a great learning process. Well, Carol said that, it's just um, 
something that I feel I've been vetting now for whatever, 25, 30 years. I mean, it's just, um, I am so much richer as an art historian from all the works I've seen and the, the discussions that we've had and the kind of, you end up having to make decisions, which is also part of the deal. So you, you're not, you can't just let it be. Oh, well, yeah, maybe, maybe not, but you've got to end up with a decision somehow or another. So it forces you to come to terms with these works of art that are not always, um, you know, crystal clear. And so you have to, what are the nuances? Is it school of attributed to um, circle of, you know, what, how big can you get and still be fair to the dealer and to the buyer and be truthful to your own level of knowledge? Yeah. I think that that's putting it absolutely in a nutshell, uh, being truthful to yourself, but working in the interest both of the fair and of the buyers, because you don't want to bring, you don't want to allow works to come to the fair that are of a quality that Tefaf does not represent. And, and you want to protect the buyers as well. So it is, it is a sort of uh, little trifecta of problems. And uh, I think with that, I would like to ask uh, anybody who has questions to come up to the standing mic, or if not, I think Rachel will um, take questions that are virtual. Hello, I, I'm Mary Ann LaMonica, and I actually was on a vetting committee in, I guess, 2019 before the pandemic. Um, and it was my first time, and I found it to be fascinating. And I'm a decorative arts and design person. So I was sort of in the 19th, late 19th century, early 20th century. But my concern, because we're here with a lot of curators, is that I, my question, and, and perhaps it's not really to you all, but perhaps you know, that it seems like the, the skill that you're bringing or that I was asked to bring is of connoisseurship and of having spent time looking at collections and knowing, you know, being able to recognize things. And I worry that we're not, we're not bringing people into the field who are, have, are being given the kind of connoisseurial um, education, or I don't know what to say, experience that perhaps you all were. And I wonder if that's a concern to you individually as curators or to the TFAF people. I guess I would say that um, I agree that I think connoisseurship is less taught in academic programs that, or is less a component of academic programs than it used to be. But I also think that as curators, what we do is, you know, we look at works of art, we're constantly making decisions about, do we want to include this in an exhibition? Do we want to acquire this for our museum if we work for a collecting institution? So we, um, you know, we may not be thinking about that as connoisseurship per se, but in fact, that's what we do day in, day out over time. So, you know, I think probably, a perfect better wouldn't be someone who just finished a graduate program and started working as a curator yesterday. But you know, it doesn't have to be somebody who's been in the field for 50 years. It can be someone who's been looking carefully at works for seven or eight or nine years. Um, but I think it's the care and some amount of experience that lead to that ability to be a connoisseur on that level. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much for this illuminating panel. Uh, my name is Kenneth Patton. I'm an archeologist like Andrea. I work as a curator at the Getty Villa in Malibu. And I had a very practical question, which is if there are 16 or so on a committee, do you have to reach unanimity? Um, or what happens when there's a difference on the committee? Is other works downgraded? Um, how, you know, Unanimity is rare in our field, I'm especially gonna, when things- I'm just going to say something yeah. before Arthur does, is that we don't have anywhere close to 16 people on our committee. <laughs> and we have, I mean, and there's so much modern and contemporary now. I mean, the fair in New York is 80% modern and contemporary, but obviously much smaller than in Maastricht. It's huge in Maastricht. And we actually have to split ourselves into two subgroups of three people each with the conservator 
floating between the two. But even with so three of you, say it is it is um, consensus. <laughs> so it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do have to arrive at some it, consensus, but arriving at consensus with three is different from sixteen. Yeah, yeah. So Arthur can talk right. to the sixteen. You've got a very good point, absolutely. Um, but I think the uh, so I think for a lot of the decisions, they're they're pretty um, uniform. The you know unanimity in in the uh, reactions when somebody brings it up it's interesting because a lot of times you walk by you don't see something and somebody because of that experience will have said you know this is this this is wrong and, the, and then we'll have a discussion and then i think it's pretty clear what the that is you know whatever the answer will be however that is not the case and i mentioned that sometimes the half an hour discussions go on and that's when you have a lot of um tricky issues going on and it's not unanimous by all by any stretch but it's a majority vote in the end um that is that's that is not so often the case but it does happen but we always vote at the end and i would say that there are some there are generally some holdouts so i'd say this there are a lot of times that it's not 100 percent and I, sometimes it's closer to 40, 40 60. I think uh, one of the committee uh, chairs told me that he asks in his committee that those people who are specific uh, experts in a particular artist, please speak up. Uh, and if the others have anything else to add, then they can add it as well. But they listen to the first expert first. And it does have to be a, a consensus uh, at the end of the day. And um, of course, none of us are infallible. Uh, and uh, we only have two things we can do to the work to say, either say it is not what it pertains to be. So it has to be removed altogether because it's simply, it's a fake, it's not by this artist or whatever or if we don't feel quite as strongly about it as that, we can ask the dealer to downgrade it, to say attribute it to or from the school off, et cetera. And that is then up to the, up to the dealer what he wants to do. Yeah, but even, even then we have a lot of discussions. Is it studio <laughs> of, is it, you know. That's when it gets what, tricky. How, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, it is fascinating to, to, to have this unfold. And you really feel in the end, okay, I, I don't, think of all the years I've been there that I came away from a decision and felt bad about the, what we always resolved, even if I wasn't in, in the, the majority. It felt like, okay, this was, this was good arguments, good discussions, I can live with it. Maybe the dealer is not so happy, but it, it's really, the deal, we're not worried about how the dealer feels, basically, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and also one of the things we do not do is we don't pre-vet. I've been asked that a couple of times that dealers are a little uh, unsure about a picture or a work of art that they want to bring, which is going to bring, which is going to be very important to their stand, and they want to have it pre-vetted. And we say, I'm sorry, without having seen it, we will not opine on it because it has always been our, I think, contention that we need to see the thing life. It is, it is a completely different thing if you see something uh, virtual uh, than if you are actually confronted with it. And so we don't, we don't want to do it uh, without af actually having seen it. And the dealer will have to take his uh, chances. Yes, ma'am. Well, as a follow-up question, um, what is the afterlife of something that's maybe been downgraded? Because dealers can be very vehement about their belief in an attribution um, can you comment on that? Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, mean, I mean, vetting is in the interest of the fair and it's in the interest of potential buyers. So if a work of art is downgraded for whatever reason, um, yeah, well, I mean, there are many specialists in the fair and the art world is a small world. So there's always a possibility that that objects show up in the in the art world somewhere, whether if it's on auction or in... in uh, and another possibility is that there is within one or two or three or four years, whatever, that the dealer finds new evidence, new proof that yes, it is a painting by that or that. I mean, things are not, um, most opinions are, are really, black and white, I mean, that's okay. But 
the things that are moving, uh, yeah, there is there is scientific research, and yes, it is possible that 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 opinions might change over years. Uh, so, the afterlife of an object is um, well, there there is an afterlife. Um, however, we and the, the vetting committees for the TAFAF are only responsible for the period of the fair, and that's it. Can I just add? I mean, you're absolutely right, but I just want to say that the that same object may come up with the attribution of the art a deal it wants two months later in a fair someplace else. But that, that, is, that is not the responsibility of the TAFOF um, vetting committee. But that brings me to one question I was going to address, actually, Andrea. Um, we were always talking about transparency, and of course, it's it's an art fair, so it's the the the, the buyer really has to beware. And these days, it's unbelievable what's out there on the internet as far as information goes. And I was just going to ask Andrea, do you find that people become more uh, knowledgeable before they acquire things? Or have you noticed that collectors uh, you know, are willing to share their information or yeah, scholars? Well, I've noticed that collectors are willing to share their information. I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure in terms of people are more knowledgeable because they recognize um, the potential exposure, right? Um, if they um, buy something with, um, about provenance, um, like long-term. So I, I, I don't really know that, but the fact that we have um, things like the art register and then um, the um, different um, ivory um, conventions, it, it seems that there's more information out there. What I was actually really interested in um, thinking what Carol was talking about in terms of expertise and knowledge, like who has, like how do you acquire the, this knowledge and like what type of knowledge is important for these vetting process? Because for me, the reason why I'm knowledgeable about documentation is because I've um, been on the field and I'm an archeologist, but the question is how do people obtain knowledge in a sense that they don't have to wait 50 years or 25 years in order to get, you know, to be a part of the vetting committee. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear. Well, I will say when the first year that I vetted in um, Maastricht, was the last year, I think, and you can correct me, that there were people on the vetting committees who came out of the commercial art world. So there were auction house experts and actually dealers who were on the committee. Um, and then Tafoff made the decision that those were interested parties and that it was inappropriate for them to be vetting either their competitors or works that they might handle down the road or whatever. So those people are no longer on the committees. I will say that I found the people from the auction houses to be phenomenal sources of expertise because they look at so much stuff all the time. And they often are looking at, you know, we go to museums and we, you know, there are labels on the walls. They go to, you know, who knows where and are looking at things in, in attics and, you know, nothing is labeled, it's filthy, it's whatever. And um, so their, their knowledge is really awesome. And I will say, I still miss that expertise on the committee. Um, happily, there is one member, um, she's been on and off because of um, you know scheduling things, but um, who used to work in the auction world, who now works in the, uh, works for a private collector directly. So she is no longer in the commercial art world, but she still has that background of knowledge, but that is, that is something I actually wish that I had. So, um, you know, that's something that I think most curators don't. Yes, ab absolutely. I just want to make a comment for, for people in the audience who may not know, because you haven't said it, that this is all done as pro bono work by all of you yes. incredible <laughs> curators who take the time out of your busy schedules to do this. Um, so I think that's important because I don't think everybody knows that that's a, this we is, are, a, we are not paid. To this is this. an unpaid gig. Yeah. And, <laughs> no. and, and, and yes, go ahead. Can you tell us quickly just about the vetting process for getting the galleries into the fair? That may be getting the galleries into the fair. They have to apply to, to the organization of TAFAF. And, uh, it is also a very expensive undertaking. I understand. Yeah. You can imagine that. I mean, to bring in, to fly in uh, over 200 people uh, internationally to this Maastricht. Is how, how to get the dealers in. 
how to get the dealers into Oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry. I, I thought you, you were mentioning the, the, the vetting members. Now, the dealers, they have to apply, of course. There's a waiting list in, in several sections. And since TAFOF is a, is a marketplace, um, the, the directors and the, the, the committee who is in charge of that is looking for a, a balanced, attractive fair with old masters, with, with nowadays more a mix of objects, contemporary as well as as old masters, ancient art. I mean, it's it's a bit what it's it's following taste of and maybe making taste of potential buyers. So what you can see at art fairs, whether if it's Freeze or or uh, Art Basel or the Tefaf, you can see the new trend or the, maybe the future trend of what people might collect in 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 the future. So the the, the challenge is to, to, to compile a fair of interesting dealers who can bring fresh objects um, that, that have the potential to attract uh, yeah, uh, buyers. I mean, it's, it's a marketplace where, 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 where buyers can see new, new well, not, not new, but market fresh objects. Mm -hmm. And since that is, that's a real challenge because market fresh is getting more and more difficult, <laughs> difficult. Uh, talking about old masters. I mean, yeah, where, where can you find a new Rembrandt? I mean, now and then it happens. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a real challenge. It is. And as you probably know, those who have not been yet to TFAF, I would uh, urge you to go and experience it. Perhaps it's possible to uh, start as a better of shadowing somebody you know to uh, get some insight into what this process is about. Um, I think it is, uh, for all of us, as you can probably hear, it's a wonderful learning experience. And in a way, I think that is the great, wonderful quality of our field altogether. We never know everything. We are always learning. So I think with that, we can um, thank you all for your attention and wrap this up. Thank you, everybody. That was really fascinating to me. I learned a lot. And I would say that about what I've learned so far from these last two days. And this was the wrap up session for day two. And of course, we have another day starting tomorrow at 9am here in this space or in the virtual space, if that's how you're joining us this year. Um, and I just want to introduce myself. My name is Mary Kay Lambino. I am deputy director and curator at the Lehman Loeb Art Center at Vassar College. Um, but I'm here at this microphone in my role as co-chair of the Benefit Conference Committee here at AAMC, along with Hannah Byers, who you heard from, who's also one of our, our, our lead sponsor um, in her role at Sotheby's. So I'm about to tell you a little bit about the members party, but before I reveal all the secrets of the party, <laughs> I have you as a captive audience, so I can take this time to thank the rest of our sponsors. Our lead sponsor, of course, is Sotheby's. Our friend sponsors are David Swerner and Bard Graduate Center. And our benefactor sponsor is Wovo. Supporter sponsor is Tefaf. And individual sponsors include Mishi Shigargian, Marie Jose Kravitz, Myung Lee, Rene and Richard Menschel, uh, Fred and Nancy Poses, Anthony and Sandra Tamer, and Kristen Tierney. And our foundation supporter this year is Samuel H. Kress Foundation. So thank you to all of our sponsors. And, and you probably have seen the advertisements that have been scrolling by on the screen. Thanks to all our advertisers as well for helping make this happen. Um, it was a challenge, I think, especially to do the first hybrid conference. Um, so far, I think it's an, an amazing success. So thank you all. Um, so next is the members party, which is happening at the Whitney this evening. And I just have a couple of protocol things to know about. It's a pre-registered event, but registration can happen at, at check-in at the Whitney and the fee is $40. And just know that if you're a New Yorker, you're used to this proof of vaccination is required for entry um, as it is for the museum in general. 
and the time of the reception is 7 p.m. That's when the doors open and it will last until 8.30. It's on at 99 Gansford Street in Lower Manhattan. Um, there's a pretty easy subway to get there. Uh, I don't know if it's still raining out, but I, I think we'll probably all need a little fresh air after today. Um, so I hope to see you all at the party and thanks for all being here. And I will hope to also see you tomorrow morning at nine. Thank you.